we'll just have fun today and no education. <laughs> so if you came here very seriously looking for some serious medical and or spiritual and other knowledges, you will be very disappointed because we should just have fun in life, right? Yeah, so, so in a way, I'm kidding, in a way I'm not. Um, I think we make learning so very serious that we lose the playfulness of our learning. And so I'm inviting you to have a very easy, playful, joyful day. Um, for me, um, it really is a privilege. I feel this is a house, it's a sacred place. It just isn't an ordinary place to be at. How many, how many places out there are where prayers are a focus of living? How many places would you find out there? Certainly not in McDonald's. <laughs> you know, certainly not in the usual runs of our life. So it's absolutely a very great privilege, at least for myself, to be here with sisters. And, and they are living books. They are living treasures. We often read books when a person has already not, has already departed in physical sense, but their guidance is left behind, right? We read their books, oh, it's such a great thing. These sisters are living books in Among Us. And it truly is a privilege to be with living books because you can have an interactive dialogue. You can learn from them, you, know, you can talk to them. You can learn from their life stories, right? At least I find it such a privilege to be in that interactive dialogue mode. Because once things are gone, physically speaking, uh, I just came back from Turkey, um, and uh, landing in New York and looking for the bags, because every eyes was in the bag, claim area, you know, the bags were going like this, <laughs> turning around, and, and, you know, and then they would not come, and they, oh, my bag is not here yet, right? Okay. And I saw an elderly woman in a wheelchair on one side, and I just remember my mother. You know, she has since passed away. She really looked like my mother. And she was like my mother. She was one of her mother. And I missed my mother at that moment. While everybody else was looking for bags, I was looking for bags too. But 90% of my attention was paying attention to that woman. And I said, what a beautiful woman sitting there in a wheelchair. And one of these days, I would be sitting in a wheelchair and somebody else would bring in a glass of water from me, right? I hope that somebody will. So, we live in a very dynamic life. So, I'm inviting you to not only know the person that you already know, but also know the person that you don't know today. Okay? So, during this meeting and gathering, it's very natural for us to just come together and find the person we know, right? And I want to sit on that table. And that's perfectly okay. But I invite you to also know the person that you don't know because you may not know them without knowing them, right? Okay, so we have to reach out. So that was one of our reasons for us to kind of come together, that we get to know that we don't know. So what I'm going to show here is not as interesting and exciting as would be a person that you don't know right in this room. Okay, so that would be very important for us to set that intention. Let me get to know somebody and let me learn from them, and let me be a good listener. Because sometimes we want to tell our own stories. Right? My story is like, so that somebody else listens. Maybe we can take turns in listening, and also inviting, and being able to be fully in a deep listening mode, as we are paying attention to when somebody else is talking, rather than looking at my watch, when this is going to be over, will make this day a timeless day. So let's not look at the watch too much, except when we have to get a person out of here <laughs> on the speaking mode. Uh, so that's my intention, and, and that's where we begin to have a conversation. So this will be more of a conversation than a didactic. It's a community gathering rather than a learning from the podium. Okay? So we kind of are collectively going to learn from each other. So with that said, um, I just want to kind of make sure that I don't forget the credits and some of the rituals that are important. Uh, so for that purposes, we will have uh, those who are seeking out credit hours of various shapes and forms. Uh, I just want them to know how to be able to accomplish that goal. But you would, would you share what you want me to speak? So um, for all of you who are looking for continuing education credits, um, I'm going to be speaking
and we are happy to give you the CEU units. So you're going to have um, six continuing education units for anybody who wants them. Um, there's a evaluation form for the day that you'll have to complete that has a space for your email address or your home address, and then they'll be sent to you after the conference. So the evaluation forms are on the registration desk, and at some point you will just pick up your evaluation form, complete it at the end of the day, and then leave it at the registration desk at the end of the day, and I'll collect them, and then I will mail or email the continuing education certificates. <coughs> Thank you so much for, for giving the credits so, so that we all know so that we attended a gathering. So let me kind of, uh, uh, why did we do, even do this conference? So I want to kind of get that context. Um, so by my training, I am a psychiatrist. Uh, psychiatrists have to go through medical school and then four years of training. So there's a medical background to, to be able to become a psychiatrist. Uh, often people say, well, what's the difference between psychologists and a psychiatrist? Uh, so there's a medical mind, even though the medical mind then enhances its capacity to learn human behavior. So we do medicine, then we do you know, psych you know, therapies and counseling and whatever comes our way. So within my specialty, I began to then also get interested in addictions. Uh, so I got, uh, you know, subspecial, uh, you know, of, say, um, uh, training and education and, and addiction psychiatry. Um, so I was in a time when I was in a quest of learning, so I became a geriatric psychiatrist, which is dealing with people who are elderly and have psychiatric issues. Then I also became forensic psychiatrist, that's law and psychiatry interface, you know, when people do behaviors or conduct which may not be very prudent, how to discern it is a willful thing or a wishful thing and, and how to you know, discern between criminal behavior versus psychopathic behavior versus uh, disease-driven behavior. Um, uh, and the last thing I did on the educational model was quality assurances and I, I was intrigued by the changing healthcare environment and I knew the health was changing, the pairs were changing, so was the dynamic of how the healthcare was being delivered. Uh, I remember the very first time somebody from Arizona called me, a doctor from an HMO, and said, I want to talk to you about your patient and make sure that you're doing the right things. Mm -hmm. so that's very interesting. <laughs> so somebody from Arizona, so I gave my spiel of you know, what I'm doing or not, and then that became a routine. You know, so after I would make rounds in a hospital, I would have seven or eight telephone calls I had to make to various doctors, various parts of the country, trying to tell them what I did that day and whether that admission was warranted, that treatment was okay, that medicine that I prescribed was all right, those kind of things. And I began to realize that's really interesting. You know, so every time I have to justify you know, what I'm doing. And that's very cumbersome, very, very challenging. But nevertheless, that was happening. You know, so the, the shift was happening from a clinician on the field to somebody deciding who pays for those treatments, whether it's worth getting paid or not. And then you always had this little, uh, little thing on your back. Well, you must take care of the patients, but if you don't do it right, if your documentation is not right, we can always come back and harass you and find you. <coughs> and you may have to reimburse the money we already have paid you. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> it's almost like going to a restaurant and then after five years going back and saying, I didn't like your lunch that day, could you return that money to me? So I just don't like it. And you know, please reimburse me for the $20,000 I spent on your restaurant. But the food is already gone, I'm sorry. But you must repay me. So that whole payment and the issues which were are, are surrounding those things were creating such a fear in the hearts of the caregivers because you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing, you want to make sure that you know, the people who are you know, paying, they can come back and do an audit, and then you, know, you want to make sure that, you know, that everything is done right. So that fear was a very awakening to myself, and I said, oh, something is changing. I cannot practice the way I 
used to practice when I was at San Francisco Hospital. That was my last practicing ground where I really practiced the way I like to practice. And the sisters over there would say, we are not in a business of doing care. We are in the art of caring for our people. It is caring for the people, hungry, lonely, tired, whatever they are. We are doing that. We're not in a business. And I thought, what a change that has occurred. So now if you end up in an emergency room, if you don't have an insurance card, I would imagine that you may not get that proper care that you are deserving, right? Okay. So, so keep in mind, it has already happening, right? It's already has happened. So that was the background of my own evaluation of what really I wanted to do in my life because I did not want to live in fears. I did not want to live in caring for something that somebody else was deciding from Arizona for me. So thus, this journey began. And then I realized that even if I have an insurance card in my pocket, it does not guarantee a good health care for me. Okay? So it means if I end up seeing a doctor, actually Sister Bernadette and I were talking, and she said, I just fired my hematologist and oncologist because she was not paying attention to me. How many times you're talking to a doctor and they are rushing you through that process? Okay. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so remember that, remember that, because those will become vital as, and we spend so much of our time seeing patients who cannot even make their co-payments. And I'm not exaggerating. $30. People cannot, it's a middle class which cannot even make their co-payment. And yet they want to come and get good care. And they want to be able to you know discern, you know, because not everybody, you know, gives individualized, tailor-made care. There's only one place in town which even gives you shoes, a little little shoe in Squirrel Hill. You go there, they will actually go up, get a shoe for you, sit down and talk to you. And I always go to little shoes. <laughs> I want to talk to somebody. I want to have somebody tell me this is a good shoe for you because I don't know. You know, even a simple shoe is important, right? Because it's an investment of 40, 50, 60 dollars, right? And so I go to that shoe place because I like somebody telling me because they all look the same to me, right? 90 percent are made in China, right? Okay. So, but I want a shoe that will last me for a while. So our bodies are more sacred than a shoe. We need a teacher. We need a person. We need somebody who can guide us and allow us to be healthy and live in healthful place, right? Because these are a gift of God. Our bodies are not ours, right? Remember, we were born in this world without our permission. We will leave this world with, whether we like it or not. And in between, we have X number of years. And that number of years is our time on this earth, right? So it's our job to be able to recognize what are my body needs. So may I, what I tell you during this conversation, be with the intention of giving you truth and nothing else may come from my mouth. I set that intention because I really don't care to have more patients in my life. I already have plenty full, but I want to have more people who are healthy in their lives so that they're living more healthfully. You know, because what are our needs? A place to live, right? a shelter, some food to eat. So basically speaking, in 400, 50 bucks or less, we can live for a month, right? So what else is, is access? So the information here is going to be based on some very highly critical thinking model. It's not going to be something that I want to sell you a medicine or an idea or a program because I really don't care. It doesn't, it's not even important for me. But I have discerned what is, what is good health and how do we decide that? So, Based on that, these are some of the informations. I am a collector of data. I'm not making up the data, but these are the issues. So the U.S. healthcare cost per family more than doubled in nine years. We used to have X number of you know, 9,000 per family. By 2011, 19,393. And this is just 2011, 2015. And this graph is not going to go backwards. Just trust me. Those people who manage healthcare costs, they know that the cost is going. The cost of medicine is going higher. The cost of wizards, everything is going higher. Right? 
I have people who will sometimes tell me, I have the choice of either getting food or my medicines. And I'm not exaggerating, you know. I used to have patients who would get $15 for a month supply of a medicine. Now the medicine they're costing is sometimes 800 bucks for just one medicine, right? The cost of medicine is skyrocketing. If you don't know that, you will one day because it just is the effect of life. So some of the facts are uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, how many trillion dollars of total healthcare cost. Then some people, and these are reimbursed cost from insurances and all of that. And you will see over time the reimbursed cost from the insurance is going to go down and people will have to pay more out of their pockets as we already are seeing and feeling. So some people decide to get their own care and they go see a chiropractor, they go see, you know, therapist of this sort and that sort. And so there's a very small chunk of money that is being spent out of pocket and, and then it divides as to how that's being spent. So people are taking care of some of their own health needs by their own self and they're using discerning, you know, it's almost like which phone should I buy, which shoe should I buy, right? Where do I get my health care? So there's a good news in the middle of this whole crisis situation. So people are doing self-care, and what does that mean? You know, they're kind of getting into, you know, the yoga, and the qigong, and the homeopathic medicine, relaxation techniques, um, and you can see several of these things, the products and whatnot, and natural things. So there's an emerging self-care model which is evolving as we speak. And very, very important, if there's one take-home point, you are your best healthcare administrator. That means you sitting in this body. And if you don't take care of yourself, why would anybody else take care of yourself? Why would, why would I be worrying about your health if you're eating McDonald's every day? You know, that doesn't really make any sense. So, so those are, you know, so these are some of the numbers, and I just picked up these numbers right from, you know, either NIMH, you know, some of the CDC, you know, these are the larger bodies of uh, who define, you know, so various natural products people are buying, $15.4 billion are being spent. Massage and Tai Chi and Qigong, and we actually have a Qigong teacher with us, you know, Ted is here to talk about that in, in his lecture later on and chiropractic need and, and the homeopathic and so forth. So these numbers are not mine. <coughs> so what does it mean for integrative healthcare? Um, it is not one or the other. If I land from a rooftop on the ground and break my neck or my bones, it does not make sense for me to sit down and meditate over that. I need my bone fixed, <laughs> simple as that. You no, know, I can breathe while they're fixing my bones. I can also pray while they're fixing my bones. I can have my family also pray for me, but my bones need fixing, right? So that's really that simple. So if there's a surgery that needs to be done, so be it. If there's a medicine that needs to be given, so be it. If there's an herbal medicine that can be taken, so be it. Lifestyle, why did I fall from the roof to begin with? You know, was I doing something that I shouldn't be falling, right? Okay. Well, it's a different thing that, you know, if I, if I drank alcohol and I'm on the roof dancing, well, there's a different story here, right? Okay. If I was fixing my roof and I accidentally fell, well, it's a different story, right? So it also depends upon in what accidents can happen. You know? But if I'm texting and also talking, and driving, well, that's an issue. Then it makes the issue. So there's the area where we can change, and there's the area we cannot change, you know? And so we have to see, you know, where we can make those changes. I mean, I can raise my leg like this, but I can raise both of my legs. Then I'll be very clear. At least, but I can do it one at a time. You know? I can do one at a time. So we have the capacity of changing something in our life, and that's the capacity we must use now, not tomorrow, today, not later, not when I have finished everything. Today we have to discern. So, so from my point of view, you know, manipulative surgery, the energy medicine, absolutely a phenomenal field of awareness. I'm not going to apologize for something that I believe in. I think that the belief in the prayers, you know, when we pray, 
those are energies we send to other people. I think that those are unseen but very powerful interventions, as powerful as is an orthopedic surgeon fixing the leg, or, or even more. That's my, <clears throat> that's my belief. So I see a lot of people with, without spiritual grounding, and now I don't even apologize, I just tell them, I think that I cannot take away your pain and your suffering. You need to have a spiritual grounding. And somebody said, but I don't believe in anything. I said, well, then my treatments are going to be very limited in helping you. Simple, you don't like my answer, I'm sorry. But this is how we operate. This is the way we are going to be. Spiritual groundings take away our ruthlessness and makes us so very painful and we suffer. And we suffer even more out of our fears. Okay? Fears are one powerful force which rusts our body and takes away the pleasure and makes us very, very joyless. So it's important that we have the option of either living in fear or living in joy. And the joy only comes from spiritual grounding. There's no other place. A Prozac cannot give it to you. And a, that's the way it goes. So it, it kind of goes beyond that, but it's important that lifestyle behavior, and I'll kind of touch upon some of these things. Um, uh, because sometimes people say, oh, it means that you don't write medicine. Oh, I do write medicines. You know, I do therapies. I also guide people to be able to say, well, maybe you need a little surgery. I think you need a little bit of herbs. You know, you need a little bit of this, whatever it is appropriate for the, it's almost like a little shoe. You know, you know a little shoe is going to guide you for the right, right place, for the right shoe. And not every shoe is right for everybody. You know? Sometimes my guidance is extremely opposite for one and a very different for somebody else. What may be direction for somebody else, so another person is in a different place in a different location and they need an entirely different guidance because they're lost in a different location. You know? But all of these things, in my mind, makes integrated medicine. You know, it's not one or the other. Um, so we'll touch base on some of those things. Nutrition, very important. Our body, remember, is made up of food. It is water and dirt. So we are sitting here, dirty water. <laughs> Literally. It's amazing that this dirty water can talk, can see, can hear, can have a heart, have a platelet. And all of that is absolutely amazing, even within this body, for this to function the way it functions. It's absolutely stunning. But really, I mean, if you, if you look at, if the spirit goes away, what's left is a body. And what does it happen to body? It just decays. It becomes earth and minerals again and water. Really, there's nothing else left, right? I mean, there's nothing really left. So for us to be able to give our body the pure bliss of good food is very, very important. We can almost reverse diseases and disorders if we truly eat what is real food. And I'll kind of go over that in a second for you. So do not give yourself the, the lousiest option. I was in Turkey, as I was said you know, earlier on. I only saw in Istanbul one Burger King and one McDonald's. 99% of the food was organic and cheap and easily accessible, at least in the area where I was staying. And I was stunned by the quality of food over there. You could not, even if you want to eat bad, you had to go and look for a bad food. <laughs> Come back, and on our way from New York driving in, I could not find a place, so we ended up buying, I think, Roy Rogers. And I could not even tolerate the smell of that food, but we ate it anyways. There was no other option, either starve or eat Roy Rogers. You know, so. So the options have to be extended so that we have easiness to find food. Physical activity, we'll talk about that. Spirituality, we I have already touched on that. Mental stimulation, I'll kind of also talk about that as well. And I'll just maybe, um, and the socialization. Maybe I'll just spend a few moments just on this circle. Um, the brain actually changes. Even as we are talking, brain is already changing. When we were in medical school, we were taught that once you have X number of neurons, uh, something bad happens to a neuron, too bad, you're done. That has changed. We actually grow new neurons, and now we know without any, any, any evidence of doubt, even in the memory, 
department, and we know for sure that that happens there. We also know by default that other areas of the brain can also regenerate. Synapses are always clicking and clocking and seeing what's happening. So the people who stay very busy, engaged, and excited, they're growing their brain. It's really that simple. You don't have to get into some special uh, you know, computer-based game. Actually, they don't even work, basically speaking. You know, What really, really works is if you go out and have a walk, you talk to somebody, and you hear something new, and you, kind of, you, you, you get excited about something, it means your brain is happy. A happy brain is a good brain to keep. Socialization. We, need, we are a social animal. We need to have a contact with people so that we know that we have a sense of belonging. It's very important that we have a social sphere of people, people who have a very small number of people who that they can call upon in case of emergencies or connectedness. Their risk of heart attack is much higher than those who have X number of friends that they can talk to and that they know that they can call upon. Very small, simple things. Now the science is proving it without any, any doubt. Nutrition, socialization, physical activity. So uh, research after research, um, com compared to all the antidepressants, all the anti-anxiety medicines, all the treatment for memory impairments and, and all kind of stuff, medicine-wise, exercise always wins. Simple. Exercise wins in all head-to-head -head studies. There's no question about that. There's absolutely no question about that. Isn't that simple? It's good for your arthritis. It's good for your heart. It, an exercise, you don't have to go to racket club. You just walk around. You're getting your exercise. Absolutely that simple. You know, simple things are there. It's free. You can walk anytime you want to or not. So what does it mean to be really healthy? How do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Are you refreshed and ready to go, or groggy, grumpy, and fatigued? <laughs> Check yourself. You be your own indicator. If you're groggy, grumpy, and, and, and fatigued, and nobody wants to be near you, you know, check again. What's happening? It may not be somebody else's problem. It may be it's your problem. You know, I had a patient. He went to Colorado for, he did some kind of a, work where it was more seasonal work. Or, and he comes back, he says, Dr. Chandra, I stayed with a, uh, with a roommate who was from Colorado. He said he would wake up in the morning and he'd be smiling, he'd be happy like a bird. And he goes, I wake up grumpy and unhappy. And I would look at his face, you know what's wrong with him? I said, did you ever see what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, literally. And it's not very hard to achieve that goal. And it really is as close as you and I are talking, as close as you and God is giving us the blessing of living. It's as close to us. It's not a distant goal. It's as close as the sunshine and the stars and the beauty of life. So what is health? Who decides for health? And, and is it a trusted information? Who do you trust? Because there's so much of it. You Google and you'll find everything that you want to find. Um, Sandy's husband always says, you know, she's one of her nurses, that uh, Google never lies. <laughs> so whatever you want to find, you'll find something to support your belief. <laughs> it's already there, right? Okay. But who, who decides on your behalf? But I think that we really sometimes need teachers. If it's a healthcare issue, you need a healthy doctor or a healthy therapist or healthy somebody who you can trust and then they can guide you through that process because if somebody's selling something, run away from them. You know, always run away from, if they're selling their product or their idea or whatnot, but if they're inviting you to something, go here and listen and discern what's important for you. Okay? It's almost like you know, if you're buying a car, if they're that business, if they want to sell a car, they will be around you because they want to sell their car, right? Okay. But if somebody says, this is the prices of these things, then please make a decision between what we got and here are the pros and cons, then you discern, you have the option. So look for clinicians and healthcare providers who can do that for us. Story of a tree is very simple. It needs water, some air, some sunshine, some nutrition, and tree is happy and healthy. Right? So is our body. It does not require complex sciences or a physician to tell you that you don't need air. We all need air, right? Okay. But it's important how we breathe. If I'm breathing from here, 
I am stressed out. If I am breathing from my belly, I'm like a baby. Right? Okay. So we tell you to change your breathing patterns. That's all we do. We sit down and say, well, let me look at how you're breathing and most adults breathe from here. <sighs> things we do. I'm going to be in and out of this conference. I cannot stand what's next. Or I guess, you know, the time is over. Or I have thing, many things to do, bills to pay, right? Sitting here, a brain is monkeying the whole world, right? Because the brain cannot just be focused in the spot. It just has a, we call it a monkey brain, okay? So we just say, well, when the monkey brain is solving problem, your breathing will be stressful. But we want you to learn how to breathe like a baby. And the baby is happy, playful, and gets the job done. Right? The baby is, we, we are going to grow up to adult babies anymore. So we go over those things, you know, we want to kind of go over glandular health. There's a whole business out there just developing on people's fears. You know, for men, testosterone is low, so you need to get testosterone. You know, for a woman, you know, you, this hormone is low. For that is, and they are selling things. But if we give our body the right ingredients, our body knows what to do. It just is designed so very beautifully. It knows we have to get out of the way for that to function properly. We get in the way of body's internal mechanisms. So, sleep. Now, this is John Hopkins' health review, and I just picked up the language just from them as it is. This is their fall 2014 review, and their, their first thing was on the top, and it said, we are cheating on sleep. First thing, okay. Our unhealthy sleep habits, we should sleep when the sun goes down, when the sun gets up, we should wake up, at least most of us. Okay. If you're in a business where you have to be healthcare provider, you know, I have a dog, you know, I have a friend, he is a healthcare dog, and he does emergency room, well, I understand that. Okay. He has to be available. But if, you're, if your system allows you to sleep on time, that alone will take away so many of your ills and difficulty. Just that one simple thing. Quit watching televisions, because they give you 90% lies and 10% truth. And why are you subjecting yourself to unusual fear-provoking news all the time? It's the data going to my brain, right? And that, uh, that data is going to create stress. What's happening? What's happening in the Middle East? What's IS? What's this whole these thing that is going on? You know, killing and then murder. What makes news? Bad news, right? Is that all you want to hear? Well, welcome. I don't care. If you want to hear bad news and, and have bad dreams, that's your choice. I choose to close my portal at night time. And I want to be in the company of people who I can find joy in. I want to listen to something which is beautiful. I want to listen, read some magazine which is wonderful. Why should I subject myself to unusual trauma of these unnecessary fears which are being provoked? So, the next thing is God to Merrick. This is the second heading right out on the magazine. And they're saying 10 most haves for your pantry. So if your pantry needs cleaning, and just go and look at your own kitchens and see what you have. And if you have unhealthy things, maybe it's the springtime cleaning and start cleaning up your pantry and have something which really is healthy and good for you. And it's not that far. They're cheap, inexpensive, and they do a great job. Turmeric now is getting a lot of favor. It's anti-inflammatory, you know, it gets the inf infections and the cancers and many of other things. Turmeric has been around without advertisement for hundreds of years. You will never see a turmeric advertisement on your television. They will never do that, okay? But they'll do all the medicine because they have to sell, right? Okay, these are cheaper alternatives. And why do we itch? Why poverty is bad for all of us? For John Hopkins to pick up a social issue on their healthcare issue was absolutely stunning and very refreshing. Okay. Why is poverty? Sisters of Charity take a wow of poverty. Isn't that beautiful? And how many people take wow of poverty? People like me are running after money day in and day out. All of us are of the mighty dollar. Without that, I will not have a good retirement. No? How many of us know my neighbor how is he, he or she sleeping? How are they doing or not? We live in a very individualized manner, and we fear others that we don't know. And that's why I'm inviting us for us to kind of get to know other people. You know? 
And then we have all these worries which will never end. They will never end. Okay? So we have to also recognize that in our country now, the divide between the rich and the poor is becoming more and more. The middle class has much less, and thus a person cannot even make their $30 co-payment. It's just the real issue, folks. It's not somebody, and they're saying it's not good for us. You know, it's bad for all of us. Even the rich who has it, it's bad for them. You know? So if somebody comes in and picks up a gun and, and shoots in a Monroeville mall, it's bad for everybody. Because you could be standing there. So rather than saying, oh, we have these low-income houses, now people living in Monroeville, and we should really kind of move away from them, well, get to know them, get to understand them get to reach out to them, get to hug them, rather than running away from them. And that is something that for them to pick up and then make a, make a news is very important. Why our food is still not safe. This is John Hopkins. They're saying our food is not safe. That, that's the truth, folks. That's absolutely the truth. And diet soda is downside. So people think, oh, I'm going to change from here to slow to diet soda. It's even worse for us. Okay. So. So I'm just going to, uh, somebody will be mindful of the time. I don't, I'm not, this morning, life is always very interesting. Um, I, for two weeks in Turkey, I had my glasses with me, and I could find them every day. This morning, when I'm leaving house, I did not find my glasses. <laughs> so I said, either I go there on time, or keep searching for my glasses. So I can't see very well today, except that I know that all of us human beings are here. But I certainly cannot see that clock. So if somebody can give me a little, warning of time, maybe, I'm sorry? Beautiful, thank you. So, I just want to kind of now kind of take you into a deeper scuba diving mode. This, this body of ours is very complex. The brain, it's connected to the parasympathetic system, the sympathetic system, it is the hub of operation. If my brain is not a happy brain, my body is not a happy body. If my thoughts are not happy, my body is not happy. It just is that simple. Okay? It does not mean that we will not have stressed out, difficult, unusual thoughts. It is the management of those thoughts that is important. Okay? So it's not that we as human beings will not be subjected to chaos and pain and suffering and losses and tragedies. We will be and we have to be. We are going to have to be subjected to the life forces I was reading an article uh, in Parabola. It, it, it's whole focus is angels and demons. And I, I love, I, I, as much as I love reading the Howard you know, Journal of Medicine, I also love reading about the philosophy. And, the, and it said, one of the sentences that stuck in my mind was, it said, in our life, angels and demons are walking among us. Okay, they are with us all the time. Even if we are subjected to somebody who is demonic <coughs> and or difficult, that lesson has to be learned as well. The only person who is going to teach us that lesson is who is going to create hardship in our life. Nobody else can teach us that lesson. So when we have difficulties in our life and we don't like them, it's important to embrace them and see what's the message. Is the message of God through Angels is the message of God through difficulties. All our messages from beyond, all are noble, all are beautiful, all have to be embraced, and all are a learning opportunity. We just want happy, nice, wonderful life, good luck. Okay? I don't know if on this earth we are going to have that one. We will have the challenges, whether I wear my glasses, whether I find them, I have to still be able to discern and to go through life. And those are parts of life, the more beliefs we have, the more faith we have, the more easily we can manage those difficulties. It's really that simple. But the life becomes very complex, but if the brain is having unhealthy fear, then anger, then confusion, and sadness, and that's the bad news that we are already seeing, then it affects my heart, my liver, my lungs, my kidney. Every aspect, every single cell of my body is affected by my brain's thinking. I can prove it without a reasonable doubt. So thus, importance of recognizing you know, that thoughts, uh, our thoughts, you know, when, whenever we are feeling good, our thoughts are usually about things we like, 
praise, gain, pleasure, and fame. When we are feeling uncomfortable and irritable and fed up, our, our thoughts and emotions are probably revolving around something like pain, loss, disgrace, or blame. You just have to see. All of these are addictions. Addiction to praise, addiction to this. They are all wonderful addictions. So good habits, bad habits. We are given the ability to discern and make choices though. We are given that ability. So I do not particularly care when people come in and they are in a very profound victimized role. I can't do it. And blaming it on everybody and not seeing it in themselves. And, and that is what really, if there is something that takes me off is that glorified victim who is sitting in front of me and would not make any choices of their life. I said, you know, you got to make choices. I cannot swim for you. If you're drowning, you need to know how to paddle your feet and leg. You know, there's no way that in the in the life's water, I can be your, I can guide you how to swim, but you got to learn how to do that yourself. So, so I'll kind of pick a few things here and there in the last few moments that I'm going to be rambling. These are very powerful sciences. If you see, what's the predominant color in this whole picture? Red, okay. So these guys have figured it out, the Coca-Cola guys have figured it out. Red is a color that people are attracted to. Okay. And actually there's a deep psychology to that. Red color has a lot of attraction. That's why we give red roses, red lipsticks, red this and red that. Okay. So they have figured it out. So even the color itself is used to sell a product. That simple. It's really that simple. You think that people who are selling you things don't know your psychology. They have psychologists on their boards. They have psychologists who are doing their researches. And they know what will get you captured by your psychology. It's almost like getting a fish. And then when you're caught in that fish, in that little, you know, little whatever that fishing hook is, then you're caught. Then you're, then you're engaged. Then you will be in pain if you want to let go of that. So, but I rather suggest that you have carrots and give each other flowers. And this Dorito is no good. If you think Dorito is beautiful, it's also made red. And using the appeal of the lips and the redness of the lips, they sell products. Okay. So you're going to become better shoppers so that you're able to see what is my psychology at play and what really is not good for me. And I'll just kind of um, there's an extraordinary science prediction of the junk food. Mind-gut connection, I'll just make a comment here. We call our guts our second brain. If you're having a lot of gut issues, maybe your gut needs some caring. Okay. It has bacteria, which are fun and beautiful. They make antibiotics. They do wonderful things for us. We have made the bugs all bad things. Bugs are absolutely the most remarkable host I mean, we are the host and they are our guests and they're, and they're very important to keep. So important, if your gut and brain are not healthy, your body is not going to be healthy. Natural pharmacy, you know, we can use salts and foods. This is the mitochondria, which makes our energy. And that little, little, little thing in our, in our body is our powerhouse. And if it, needs the, if it gets the right ingredients, you feel refreshed, energized. If you give it a dirty food, and a McDonald's fry just doesn't like it. I'm just going to pass through some of these things to uh, so eat more nuts and whole grains. We talked about neuroplasticity, and um, I will go into the integrative medicine here. Um, since I don't have my glasses, I will skip that. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? But if you can read it, that's lovely. Basically, basically says that, you know, I have to come here too. <laughs> I don't have time for my doctor appointment. Go in my place and tell him you are having trouble sleeping at your desk. And don't let him sweet talk to you about diet and exercise. <laughs> so we are we are a culture of wanting pills to fix our ills. And this is not it's not it's very real, you know. So the treatment of the future, and I'll just kind of spend a second here. 
the most common thing that we see in our practice are mood disorders, psychotic disorders, anxieties, personality disorders, addictive disorders, intellectual impairments, and dementia, and all those kind of stuff, you know. And all of them respond to a very simple thing that I was saying, we really don't need to. Um, so sleep is very important. Sleep on time. Wake up on time. I think that will help you in a lot of ways. Pain is a very important thing that we see a lot. Uh, the pain medication prescriptions are huge anymore. And most, more people are actually dying of overdosages from pain medicine prescribed by doctors than by car accidents. It just is a real fact. You know? We consume in America, you the pain medicine in the USA, the United States makes us, we are 4.6% of the world population, but consume 80% of the opioids. It's very important to know, we consume 80% of the opioids of the whole world. We don't like pain. And this is not my statistic, these are real numbers. And out of those, op Vicodin, if is used, and this is you know the guy from Center of Disease Control and Prevention. You know he's basically saying you know what I said. You know the more more people with crack, cocaine, everything else. You know a doctor prescription, why could end and those kind of things are killing people. And we like to know how to live. So let me just get down to uh, some last <coughs> comments here, um, and they are going to be. Uh, uh, so we can do expensive treatments, you know, which are very fancy, the robotic surgeries. I really don't care for them unless they're very important. Um, and the last few things here would be um, about... Um, so, it's important to have a playful life. Even if you're in the middle of a crisis, you can either become fearful, angry, it's almost like having a tire which is flat, you can kick it and have a broken toe, or you can get it fixed and have a deep breath and enjoy when they're fixing it. You know, those are the two options. Or do we relate to adversity in our life by either getting more angrier? These are our students, uh, PS students. We used to send them um, to a farmer uh, to grow and learn how actually uh, the, the, the things don't come from giant eagle, they actually come from earth. <laughs> <laughs> so that they know and can relate to that. Um, and so we kind of in our practice now embrace, uh, you know, forgive not because I deserve forgiveness, but because you deserve peace. You know? So when we are letting go, it's not that I want, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a saint, actually, I, I'm just trying to sleep at night, because otherwise you'll have nightmares and anger around the people that you don't like. Just last few things, as I said, I was in Turkey, so I want to share you a Turkey picture and a glimpse. This is on, this, on the side of, side of the uh, Europe. Istanbul is in between two different locations. Uh, yeah, the European side and the Asian side and the body of water in between. Um, uh, this is Rumi. Rumi is one of my favorite poets. Uh, that's where he's buried. And I went in there to enjoy his presence even if he was gone 700 years ago. Um, so the guest house, uh, this being human is a guest house. Every morning as you arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, a momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrow, you violent and sweep your house, empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be cheering you out for the rest of your life. The dark heart, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door, laughing and inviting them in. Uh, life continues to evolve. <coughs> so this was just last few things. Um, uh, this is Cappadocia. And I was absolutely stunned. People built close to, I don't know, how many churches in this landscape. And if you see over here on this mound, what looks like small openings are a beautiful church. Made in, the, made in those very nice places and beautifully decorated. And, and it, it was a stunning place to visit. And this was an 82-year-old Turkish guy who took us in an underground tour of a city when people would get invaded by different forces. They will just go underground until they will be gone, and then they'll come back up. <laughs> um, and some spices. 
and then lastly, we <laughs> came for a day. Uh, what that? You can choose You know, just be playful. And that really kind of concludes my contribution to this conversation. Uh, I truly, truly appreciate your patience as we were listening. And this truly will be my last word. You can be the king and the queen of your life. This moment, this day, make good choices for your health, use good teachers and good guides, discern who your heart vibrates with, and discern who you want to have around you, and enjoy this beautiful life, even in the midst of malice, shame, guilt, sorrows, tragedies, and difficulties that really are the art of living healthfully. Thank you for your patience.